Chloe Blank from NYU Utilities as well? Someone has joined the conference. Hello, who's joined? Patricia Brown with the City of St. Catherine. Uh, missed you because you were talking over each other. From St. Catherine? Correct. And who is that again? Krisha Brown. Krisha? Someone has joined the conference. Welcome, Krisha. Thank you. And who else has joined? Hi, we have a team here from the City of St. Catherine. Excellent. Hi, this is uh, Carrie from Thunder Bay. I also Someone has joined the conference. also have Dave Warwick here. Uh, Someone you. has joined the conference. Hi, Carrie and Dave. And Someone has joined the conference. I'll let, uh, Someone has joined the conference. I'll let people join and then we'll do a roll call. Do we have uh, Paul Clements on the line yet? We do. Thank you, Paul. No problem. We'll just wait for a couple of others to join. Someone sure. has joined the conference. Yes, good afternoon. Hello. Hi there, we're just uh, waiting for others to join the call, then we'll do a roll call. Oh, okay, thank you. Just gonna uh, try to put, we mute you for a little bit. Sure. We got a, we got a few people in the room. Great. Okay. Right, okay, we'll seeing as, um, We've got limited time. Why don't we do a roll call? Uh, I had heard uh, Krisha from St. Catharines, and Krisha, you had mentioned there were a couple of other people in St. Catharines with you? Correct. I think they're in another office. I see. Uh, do they want to introduce themselves? Uh, that's okay. We've got a whole group here. I'll save time. Okay, no problem. Uh, from Thunder Bay, we have uh, Carrie Marshall and Dave Warwick. Is that right? Is there anybody else from Thunder Bay? Oh, well, that's correct. Great. And Paul Clements. Someone has joined the conference. Paul, we have you from uh, Toronto Water. Is there anybody else joining you from uh, Toronto? No, it's just myself. Okay. Right. Um, who else uh, is on the line? Oh, from Region of Peel, we have Jerry Gorman and Catherine Murata. Jerry and Catherine, was it? Catherine. Sorry? Someone has joined the conference. Okay. That's Region Appeal? That's correct. Great. Welcome. Durham. Durham. Folks from Durham? Darlene Rumble? Hi, Darlene. How are you? That's bad. How are you? Good. Anybody else from Durham with you? Nope, just me. Great. Yes, uh, Niagara Falls Waterport, Niagara Falls, New York. Paul Drop and Rick Roll. Paul and Rick, welcome. Thank you. Peggy Slama and Carla Finley from Collingwood Public Utilities. Excellent. Welcome, Peggy. And sorry, the other person was? Carla. Carla? Finley, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, uh, Hugh Nichols, Township of Huron Kinlaw. Hello, oh, Hugh, welcome. Someone has joined the conference. Who else do we have on the line? Eric Moore from Halton Region. Hello, Eric. Uh, do we have Kiyoshi on the line as well? Um, he might be on right to my office. Okay. Excellent. Anybody from Windsor? Yep. Dave Melvin from Winwin Ken when utilities. Justin Fully Lang from Ed Utilities. Welcome. Sarah Merrifield on behalf of John Caswell with Town of Blue Mountain. Great, welcome. Thank you. Anybody from Hamilton? Yeah, you got Dan McKinnon and Andrew Greggs from Hamilton. Welcome, Andrew and Dan. Thanks. And anybody from Tay? Or Traverse City? Yes, uh, Traverse City, uh, we have Larry LaCrosse. Dave Green, and Justin Roy. Larry, Dave, and Just, uh, Larry, Dave, and Justin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And anybody from Kingsville? Okay, have I missed anybody? 
Someone has joined the conference. Carl Dewar and Joe Lewis from Utilities Kingston, Kingston, Ontario. Welcome, Utilities Kingston. Carl and Joe, anybody else on the line? Yeah, I just um, joined. It's Kiyoshi Oka from Halton Region. Hey, Kiyo, how are you? Good. Well, we've got Eric on the line and a number of others as well. Great. We've got a, a great bunch of people on the line. Obviously, a lot of interest in this. I understand, at least on the Ontario side, that uh, OWWA and Hamilton and others have also been looking into this. So we're duplicating a little bit, but we thought it was well worth getting uh, both Canadian and Americans on the line. Um, pleased to have Kerry Marshall, the Director of Environment Infrastructure and Operations from Thunder Bay, uh, on the line, who will be uh, speaking to us about Thunder Bay's experience, and Paul Clements, the Acting Director of District Operations at Toronto Water, talking about Toronto's experience. Um, the idea of this session is not to have too much on, in the way of presentations. Uh, Kerry and Paul are going to be leading off by talking about their experience and just highlighting a couple of issues really in order to uh, start a discussion. This is your call. Uh, we'd like to talk about the issues that are of interest to you, and it's really an exchange. As you can see, there are quite a few people on the line from all sorts of different municipalities, but I think the bottom line is uh, this last uh, summer uh, was really quite challenging in terms of uh, frozen pipes. So let's see what we can learn from each other. And uh, Carrie, I'll, I'll call on you if you can, just to uh, give us a bit of background in uh, uh, Thunder Bay's experience. Hey, thanks, Nicola. Um, I thought what I'd do first is just sort of talk briefly about the magnitude of the of the frozen services we've experienced here in Thunder Bay both over the past two winter seasons. So between 2013 winter season, that was really um, the first time we've we've experienced the magnitude um, in probably more than a decade or, or more. Um, the extreme cold temperatures drove the frost um, into the ground by we're estimating it around eight feet. In some cases, it was probably a bit deeper. And our current depth of bury uh, for our, our our water service connections is, is seven feet. So certainly, the frost was, you know, all around the service connections and the as well. So in in that season, we had approximately 700 properties where we asked them to continually run their water, and those services were required to run um, into early June. So at the peak of, of the issue we had, we were estimating that we had uh, around 125 uh, sort of backlog in frozen services at any time, and there were some long delays in restoring water services, but on average it was about one to two weeks and, and longer in some cases. Um, I guess to sort of compare this to what we would expect under a normal condition, we'd expect to see around 20 frozen services. So generally isn't an issue for Thunder Bay. Um, and moving in through this winter, um, we found that the frost deaths were very similar to the previous season. Um, however, a greater number of services were affected. We had approximately 1,100 properties uh, continually running their water. Uh, you know, having learned from the previous year, you know, we had a good history of, of frozen services, so we were able to, to um, mitigate the impact by contacting them earlier and, and having them run their water earlier so that we didn't have quite the number of customers without water. Um, I'm just going to uh, pass it over to Dave. Uh, he's just going to provide a, a brief um, outline of the equipment that we use uh, to, to saw uh, services in Thunder Bay. And then uh, I'll come back to me and I'll just talk a little bit about our public communication, uh, the financial impact um, this has had on, on the city of Thunder Bay, and then just share a couple of lessons Good afternoon, everybody. Um, we, we used a few different pieces of equipment to uh, restore service to houses. Uh, our primary method was using our electrical thawing equipment. Uh, this unit is called a DBH and is manufactured by Hobie. Uh, unfortunately, they are no longer in production. We looked uh, a few years back at replacing them, uh, and they are no longer available. So we went with uh, a rebuild on the unit. Uh, electrical and uh, the diesel motors were rebuilt as well. Uh, they're basically a, uh, a powerful diesel generator that we carry around that runs on high amperage and low 
minimum voltage um, in order to heat up the service lines to, to thaw the ice within. Uh, when we experienced uh, a great battle, uh, the large backlog of customers affected, we went to uh, a few private contractors in town that claimed they had equipment that would work as well. Uh, they were using glorified welding units. Uh, they were only putting out about 10 to 15 amps, uh, whereas ours were using up to about 2,000 amps if necessary to thaw main. Uh, so their units were, were not effective at all. Um, we had to go back to doing everything on our own. Uh, now these thawing units are uh, engineered uh, with safety in mind uh, when they were built. Someone has joined the conference. They basically operate as a, the same as a GFI outlet would in your house, where uh, if the amperage going coming back in does not match the amperage going out, it will shut itself down. Uh, in a nutshell, anyway. Uh, now, when we couldn't, when that equipment wouldn't work, we we often went to uh, internal thawing of the pipe using a magic kit, uh, which is a hot water thawing unit. Uh, we did have to go into the house, uh, into the home, to use this unit, and it was a lot more uh, time consuming. Uh, and it, it, it often wouldn't solve the problem as well. Um, our major issues with the, the equipment used in the, in the thawing practices was not having continuity on the line uh, after repairs or new installations. Um, if, if everything was was uh, good right away and we can get current flowing through, we could be in and out, in and out about half an hour. Um, if that wasn't the case, it could escalate into, uh, you know, digging if necessary in the middle of winter and eight feet of frost, which is not, um, you know, the fastest. That's typically what we use. Okay, that's great. Um, just to touch on the communication um, side of, of this issue, um, our communication, we largely targeted those property owners or, or directly. Um, so those who had a history of frozen services, those that we anticipated or, you know, there being potential for frozen services, so we looked at where we may have areas of shallow mains. Um, you know, we would track patterns in neighborhoods and where there were difficulties in the past in terms of thawing uh, frozen services. So our primary communication with customers was was through a letter directly to the affected property. One of the things that we were concerned about was that we didn't want uh, residents to start to run their water in here unnecessarily. Um, you know, with the extreme cold temperatures, we were also experiencing um, a large number of water main breaks and, you know, it was putting increased demand on our water treatment facility, so we were very mindful to keep track of how much, um, how much water we were able to treat and deliver out to the system. Um, for those uh, customers who were affected or were without water for periods of time, we informed them where they could have access to drinking water. We opened up um, free use of our residential water filtration to those customers. Um, and there, of course, were customers who were, who were, not, who were not able to themselves um, go there and collect their own drinking water, and so we made alternate arrangements for those folks. Um, we also opened up our uh, community services facility, so we will offer uh, access to our pools, the showering facilities, so we communicated um, that as well. Um, but most importantly, one of the one of the items that we wanted to ensure that the customers understood is that once their water service was thawed, that they were required to continually run their cold water tap on a continuous basis until further notice. Um, this is, you know, one of the areas that we we stress as a lesson learned. And, um, you know, there, there are quite a few people that accidentally turn off their tap or, you know, think because it's a nice hot day that, uh, you know, they're, they're not going to be affected if they turn off their tap. So, you know, that created some challenges for us. Um, there, there was quite an interest from the, from the media uh, regarding frozen services. You know, we did, you know, respond to media inquiries and, um, you know, answer questions that they had, but, but most of our communication was directly with, uh, with the affected site. We updated our website to contain information to frequently ask questions and recommend that homeowners can take to protect their, their service from freezing. 
Um, in terms of the financial impact of the, of the response, um, certainly we experience significant overtime costs. The FAW services generally crews were working from 8 a.m. to midnight every day during this period of time. Um, the cost for thawing of services, uh, in our case, the city uh, provided uh, the thawing services, the connections at no cost. However, uh, if they, we were called back to that residence for to re-thaw their service connection because they had inadvertently turned off their tap, we were uh, recovering costs um, to do re -thaws. We do have, it was, took a lot of administration time to, because our email right now based on a full cost recovery basis. And so now we're, we're looking at implementing a flat rate uh, for water uh, service connection costs. The cost um, that, was, that are associated with the additional water consumption from having to, to run the water at a continual basis was borne by the city, uh, and we did uh, credit uh, customer accounts the fixed uh, cost, the daily fixed cost, based on the number of days their service was connected. It was a very, uh, it's a very minimal amount, uh, but customers, you know, were quite, you know, based on, they felt quite that it was the principle of the matter. They didn't want to be paying for fixed costs when their water was frozen. Um, and then water consumption charges were estimated and billed based on the historically the increase of the property. So we were still recovering uh, water consumption uh, charges. Um, and I, as I mentioned earlier, um, the cold water temperatures extended beyond the distribution had negative operational costs on uh, both the water and wastewater treatment plants. You know, with hundreds of properties running their water to prevent the demand on the plant was far greater. And uh, water being produced, we could compare our, our demand to a hot summer day. There really were significant demands on the plant and combined with the, the number of rain breaks that, uh, that we experienced. We also experienced, just as an aside, um, storm and sanitary connections frozen as well as has made themselves. So right now we're also dealing with the damages from service leaks and from thawing activities um, associated with the frozen service connection. And just a couple lessons learned, um, you know, or, or measures that, that we've taken to try and manage the issue moving forward. If we have a an inventory of, of properties with a history of frozen services where mains may not be buried uh, at standard depth or where we have historically have had uh, difficulties thawing a particular connection. Um, secondly, cannot stress that we need to over communicate uh, with our customers in, in these situations, particularly around once the water service is thawed, you know, that they need to continually run that cold water tap and, you know, either place a sign or tag the tap so that it's not turned off uh, accidentally. And we know one more one more lesson in terms of the service connection and, and providing conductivity so that our DBH machine can be used uh, you know, effectively and efficiently in thawing services is that we recommend that particular attention be paid to ensure that jumper cables are installed in, in all new uh, service connections or when service connections are repaired. So we can have that conductivity and, and, and you know we can readily uh, saw that service without having to resort to more timely uh, alternative measures. So that sort of wraps up Thunder Bay's experience. And I'm happy to have um, some discussion uh, following the next, uh, next presentation. Thanks very much, Carrie. And uh, just uh, for points of clarification, so people don't forget what their questions were, are there any uh, questions of clarification of uh, Carrie? Okay, uh, hearing none, I'm going to uh, pass it over to Paul Clements from Toronto Water. Um, Paul, if you could just talk to us about uh, Toronto Water's experience, I guess, last half of uh, February, first half of, of March. Sure. Um, I can almost say ditto to the Thunder Bay experience with uh, some maybe just uh, scale uh, issues more than anything else. Uh, very similar in the City of Toronto, uh, have not had open water services prior to the 2014 season. Prior to that was the early 90s. Um, last year or this year, uh, over 5,000.
in call to result in 1,700 locations where we actually thawed the surf surface. Uh, in Toronto, we took the approach to excavate uh, either at the main or at the street line or at the curb box, and that's where we conducted our strong ac activities. Uh, said similar to Thunder Bay, we used the EDH machine. The city of Toronto has two units uh, of our own. Um, we did that in combination with uh, steam and, and hot water. And the experience was, depending on the type of service, whether lead or copper and size, systems worked a, a little bit differently depending on location. Of the 1,700 locations that we actually had to excavate, uh, most of them were in areas, if you're familiar with the city of Toronto, the bottom end of the Humber River and the bottom end of the John River. Uh, we have not had a chance to do a more in-depth analysis of those areas, but believe it to be a combination of infrastructure, uh, groundwater table, and soil conditions that were contributing. Having said that, we did have frozen water services across the city, but if you look at this map, the, the two areas that were most have heavily hit were those two uh, areas that are in the low-lying area within those uh, watersheds. Um, so, you know, from a, and, and I won't repeat too much because a lot of it is very similar to the, to the Thunder Bay experience, um, but uh, communication was key. Um, we have in the city of Toronto a 311 call center, and really the intent of that call center is to deal with incoming calls. It's not really constructed to deal with uh, outgoing calls. Uh, we found that customers were becoming frustrated because they were not aware of timelines, and that timelines with respect to response, timelines with respect to when there will be resolution, and more importantly, uh, what actions can they take on their part. Um, out of the 5,000 calls that we've received, obviously 3,500 of them were approximately were problems that we believe to be on private uh, property. So these are water services that are frozen just outside the building wall, and maybe as a result of a cold cellar, or maybe an internal issue where there is a roof that is not as either not uh, heated at all or uh, not well heated as other portions of the home. So we were able to resolve a lot of the problems on, on private property. Uh, which brings up an interesting point. The City of Toronto took the position that we will respond to all calls, um, regardless of where the problem lies, whether it's outside the building wall, at the street line, or at the main. Our experience, our best guess, um, the steaming method allows you to determine exactly where the creep is within the line. However, the DPH system does not allow you to come to, to that conclusion. Our best guess is that about 40% of the services that we actually saw it were frozen on, on private property. Public perception, however, is that 100% of those services are is a city issue. So we have a uh, we have a perception issue, and that goes back to communication. Um, our GM and our mayor actually did a, a very good job at uh, getting in front of the media. We had, I believe, three media scrums um, to deal with the issue um, on the correspondence side. Uh, developed a website or a portion of our website dedicated to nothing but frozen water services which spoke to issues about how to prevent them, i.e. let your water run, uh, apply heat to, the, to those uh, areas that are around the meters that are most susceptible. Um, and we found that, that once we had done that, uh, that uh, the public opinion or feedback was getting a little bit better, although uh, obviously their frustration levels were very high. Um, we also set up a, uh, a command center uh, with a combination of Toronto Water staff as well as 311 staff to make outgoing calls. So we out outreached to all of the customers to tell them where they were, uh, when they could expect to find a crew coming to their house to either provide a high line or to provide uh, a line uh, for service. Uh, we supported that with six different lead letters, uh, again, advising them to run their water. Uh, it also advised them that we would be compensating them for, um, for the cost of the water. So both from the home that was providing the water as well as the property that was eventually sawed, uh, they would find that their uh, bills would be adjusted based on the historic construction work. We did not bill uh, any of the, our customers back. We, in fact, we had multiple locations where we were going back uh, two and three times. Um, and I think Thunder Bay touched on it when the weather gets warm, people think they can turn the water off, that's not the case. Uh, but we bit the bullet and we went back and, uh, and saw some of these locations on, on multiple occasions, even though it was very clearly communicated to people to let their water run. 
Um, with respect to cost, same thing. I mean, obviously, huge overtime costs. Uh, we were bringing in contractors, really scram scrambling to find people that, A, that were available, and B, that had the capacity to do it. Somewhat of a specialized uh, function, and that's why we ended up using various systems. But the net for us was in the neighborhood of uh, almost $7 million over and above our normal uh, operating budget uh, in the way of uh, support staff and contracting costs to resolve the proposed service, service issue. Um, we do have a, a report that's going to council in June that will be speaking to not only the cost of the event, but some, re some recommendations on how to move forward. And again, uh, a, a similar approach that we're looking at uh, historic records to determine locations that are frequent flyers and uh, advising them to let their water run, and perhaps even more of a, a targeted approach to go into areas that, that we know are prone to ice, the low-lying areas of the Humber and the Don, uh, to do something a little bit more on the targeted side. Um, with respect to um, response and the level of ser service, that will also be part of the report that's going back, and whether or not the city wants to take on the position of, of bearing those costs in the future, or whether we we'll be looking at some type of cost recovery model. Obviously, it's just all very political, and, uh, and uh, right now there's not much of an appetite for that, although we might get a little bit of to, to build back on the multiple locations. Um, our interest is probably more around uh, the level of service that is to be provided, what is, what is normal, and uh, what type of remedial actions. So in some cases, we are looking at delay services. Our depth of area is 1.8 meters, and our frost at its max is probably more like 6 feet. Um, we did find some areas uh, that were newly constructed water mains where the services were a little bit shallower than, than the 1.8. Uh, so we'll be going back to target those, but those represent a very small percentage of, of the actual system. So um, what, to be quite honest with you, what we're struggling with is really what do we do uh, now that this is now year two? Um, what is a, a, a reasonable approach to, uh, to dealing with this issue, assuming it's going to happen again next year or, or in the short term? So that is essentially the, um, the Toronto experience. Great, Paul. Thanks uh, very much to you and Carrie for an excellent overview. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, maybe we can try and keep uh, the questions uh, on a thematic, um, uh, thematically just uh, starting off with some questions around um, the equipment that's used. Does anybody have any specific questions, either for Carrie and Paul or for each other, of uh, uh, problems with equipment, problems with access to equipment? Uh, who wants to lead off? Are people less interested in equipment? Uh, how about about public communication? Is there well, anything? Well, maybe uh, just before you leave the the, the equipment side, sure. um, I think I'd mentioned we do not have contracts in place current, currently to deal with this type of issue, and all of our excavations were done by contractors. So we're thinking, should we be putting something out? Should we be putting a contract out, uh, uh, some type of contingency contract uh, to obtain fine uh, services or software? So would that be something that other utilities are looking at? So, you know, we should be checking the equipment. And, you know, I can add to that. My, my line was frozen. So um, I was asking the Toronto Water uh, folks who came to my door, where did they get all the hoses? I mean, how do you suddenly find 500 to 700 hoses um, for this, the, this high lining? Uh, and they said from cement companies. Uh, well, well, actually, no. Uh, we actually got them from cement mortar lining uh, water main contractors that are in the business of installing bypass as a result of using that trenchless re rehab technique. So was it difficult? getting that many hoses once you realize? Well, that yeah, we, we were fortunate in that we have a relationship with a local contractor who is a very large-scale firm. And during the winter season, obviously, they're not in this type of business. So they do have those hoses of you know available. Now, that might be unique to Toronto. Somebody that's in an outlying area that doesn't have that contractor close by may not have that, that luxury. We were able to pick up the phone and phone a contractor who had them in his yard sitting in a, you know, in a garage, dormant. Uh, we were able to tap into that resource. And 
I thank him for that. Uh, so the, the other question is, uh, we don't have anybody on the line from Montreal, um, but uh, those of you who are following the news out of Montreal, they were using uh, the electric current technology. I don't know if it was the same machines that Toronto and the Bay have, but um, there were some quite serious fires that broke out. Yeah. And, uh, and at one point, the mayor said, we're not using it anymore, uh, which, of course, you know, then uh, leaves you with, with uh, heat and steaming. So any, uh, any concerns from Toronto or Thunder Bay or others on the line with the, the um, electric current technology? Um, Kiyoshi Oka here. Um, we had also heard the same issues with the current-induced thawing. So we kind of stepped away from it. So it's interesting um, to hear that many municipalities are still using that technology. So really, my question was around, do we feel it's a safe technology to use? Does it require some kind of modification or adapting it to this use? Of, or is it something that's just risky, but we're prepared to take the risk? If I can answer on the Toronto side, we only use the DBH machine, and probably for the same reason that Thunder Bay does, it is the only machine that is uh, that is approved for this. It's specific for this use. If you're bringing in welding equipment that doesn't have the type of safety controls on it, then you you run into the situation that that uh, that Montreal did. So we allowed it, but only with our own equipment. So we only have two pieces of equipment. And that is because the as uh, I think was it Dave in Thunder Bay was explaining that the um, if you don't have the amp. Uh, uh, level same coming in and going out, it just turns off. Is that right, Dave? Uh, yes, that is correct. Um, now, we did encounter a few issues with the electrical equipment, uh, mainly on where the panel inside the house was grounded. Um, if it was visible and we were able to remove the ground from the service, uh, if it was near the meter uh, where we were hooking up, we would do so. Uh, we did run into a few uh, occasions, very rare, I'll say, uh, but the ground was connected below the floor of the house for some reason, um, and we were unable to do it. Uh, we started getting uh, weird things happening with the equipment, and we just shut it down uh, and had to move to other methods at that point. Anybody else on uh, questions on what kind of uh, thawing equipment to use? This is Justin from Winter. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, getting away from the welder site for electric plates, right? we recently purchased a uh, rigid unit. Uh, they just came in. We haven't tried it yet. Pulled it out of the box. Yeah, AC200. I'm just curious if anybody's familiar with this machine and uh, if they've had what their experience is with it. And can you repeat what the uh, what that uh, name was? Yeah, rigid. It's made by rigid. It's an AC200 pipe sawing unit. It's a, uh, an electric current-based line unit. Anybody, uh, anybody used it or heard of it? I've never heard of it. This is Dave from Thunder Bay. I've never heard of it. Um, what, what is the average ratings on that? I'll have to look through the manual. I'm not really sure, uh, to be honest with you. Like I said, we just pulled it out of the box. So let's see. So I need it. Input 15 amp. <laughs> And what was the, uh, the amp you were using with the uh, DVH, Dave? We started about 400 amps, and we could go up to uh, approximately 2,000 amps if necessary. Okay, so um, this is going to be considered smaller. The output is only 300 amps. Okay, now we did bring in, like I said, we brought in contractors that were using smaller units. Uh, I believe it was about 10 to 15 amps, um, and they... We sent them to rethaw ones that we knew exactly where we needed to go, so we didn't have to go back. Uh, and they didn't get one done. Uh, they were unable to do it uh, with, with the smaller equipment. Now, if you can go up to 300 amps, uh, that would be running the machine at its max every time. Um, and a lot of times we weren't even able, able to get it at, at that type of anchorage. Okay. That would be a thank you. I appreciate that. It would be very interesting to see. In Windsor, we have a little bit different of a situation with only 34. Yeah. We're not well, if, it, if it's at all useful, if it uh, if it saves you digging once in the middle of winter, it probably paid for itself right there. So. Thank you. Okay. Hi, hi, Carl here from Kingston Utilities. Yeah, go ahead, Carl. 
just to um, comment on that piece of equipment, we, we don't have it as a utility. We strictly use water and steam on for the utility, but we did have a few plumbers using that piece of equipment. And um, usually if we couldn't get it with the steam, we would try that. And, and they did have some success. I wouldn't say it was every time, but um, they were able to get some of the service here in Kingston. And, we responded as a utility to about 100 and suspect there was probably an equal amount of plumbers responding to similar issues around the city. Well, that's a very good point is uh, private uh, contractors, plumbers, uh, doing this. Um, obviously, it's on private land, so some of the households will call in, but is there a danger in terms of uh, uh, you know, quality assurance, if you like, if they are using these kind of welding machines rather than the, uh, the real thing? Did anybody have any problems or get any calls about uh, plumbers using the wrong equipment? Uh, one thing that came up in news reports was uh, the city of Guelph had uh, plumbers in Halton Region had one case where um, uh, a private plumber was called in by a resident and they used the increase and they tried to dead end pump into the water service to try and thaw over a number of hours. They weren't successful, but still, <clears throat> uh, dead end uh, pumping their circulation of antifreeze against the drinking water system has uh, you know, its own uh, concerns and issues. So, is there, was anybody uh, in the communications and the messaging, was anybody messaging out, uh, you know, caution around those kinds of. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you shouldn't, you shouldn't say that they shouldn't use private contractors, but I guess. Uh, any communication to the private contractors themselves and to the households about the appropriate way to deal with uh, frozen pipes. This is Carrie. Our, our, our message to our customers was if they have a frozen service to contact our dispatch center. Um, we, weren't, we weren't directing them to uh, private companies. But I guess my question is, is there a need to be more explicit in city or municipal communication about private contractors or about what households shouldn't do? I think you make a very good point. It's still here with utilities case, and I think if, there's, if we're hearing of one reporting incident, there's probably a few more that we don't know about. So I think that you know, just from a communication position, yeah, I think we need to be clear on that. So something is done there. Okay. Uh, let's just turn to uh, communications and, uh, you know, again, I, I uh, lived through the Toronto situation, uh, hadn't really heard that there was uh, a big problem uh, or how to deal with it until it occurred to, uh, to us. Um, so how do, you, how do you prime people, I guess, before the first wave of the freezing? Uh, Carrie, you talked about it a little bit. Does anybody else have an experience? Of, of how you think you uh, you were able to um, uh, preempt some of the complaints? I, I've got a, a, a question to go back, but I'll I'll, I'll hit this one first. It's, it's Gary from Chatham. Mm -hmm. um, we we use the historical data, and you know who your frequent flyers are, um, especially uh, over the last two years because we this is the second uh, harsh winter. Um, so we'll we'll take uh, the list of frozen meters that have historically been uh, issued, and then excuse me, we'll send out notifications to those uh, mailers, um, just giving them ways to prevent uh, lines and meters from freezing. And then we'll also follow up with uh, with calls. The other thing we're going to consider moving forward this year is we have a lot of seasonal mm -hmm. properties. And you find with seasonal, you, you run into uh, run into scheduling issues, shutting them off, and turning them off seasonally. So we're going to be looking at uh, possibly uh, putting together proposals for certain areas and uh, and offering some incentives to, to do it on specific days or weeks, if you will, and uh, handle those uh, that way because we are spread out over a large area. Um, if we can hit specific areas on certain days, it would make it a lot easier for us and the customers. Yeah. Excellent. And, and if I could backtrack, I'm, I'm interested in uh, 
we're talking about private lines and, and installing private lines and just heading out there to, to take care of business, I'm interested in the liability side of that because where, where we come in, we've got the curb stop on the main and then the curb stop to the meter, that, that's a private line. We, we don't touch those. That's, the, that's for the owner. When you guys talk about drawing lines, are you talking about the, the main before the curb stop or are you talking about beyond the curb stop up to the meter? And if so, how do you handle the liability? Like, you bust that private line, who's going to replace that line? Has anybody experienced issues with that, or, or how do you handle that liability side of it? Well, I think we are talking about the private line, so does anybody want to jump in about the, uh, about the liability? Hi, Ken. Carl here from, from Kingston again. I, I think we, we did talk about that a fair amount, but it, when it got to the point where we were going to be excavating services at the, the curb stop to thaw in both directions, um, it, it, it kind of became obsolete if one or two of them broke and we had to fix them because the cost of digging 50 or 60 of these um, and you had to do a couple of it. It just seemed like it was the right thing to do, and it was hard to determine really where the, the freezing started, whether it started on the building and worked its way out or started on the roadway and worked its way in. So um, we kind of went at it with the less odd, and if something happens, we'll, we'll react. But you, you tried to identify whether it was before or after the curb stop, which is difficult at that, and then yeah. once you're in there, you guys are just going to have at it thaw it I guess you're, you're going to pray that nothing happens on the private side, and if it does, then uh, again, I, I'd have to fall back on what's the liability there. We have a lot of cast iron out there that, uh, that you, as soon as you mess with that at the start of it, you're replacing the whole thing down the line all the way to the meter, so the liability could be huge if we start messing around with that. Yeah, it, it, Paul again. Um, well, in Toronto, we've sort of taken the position both on the on the water side and on the wastewater side. We treat the entire ser service as one. Obviously, there's a city portion and a private portion. So on the wastewater side, block sewer connection, we respond to all those calls regardless of whether the problem is on private or city. But we would only fix the problem if it was on city side. Same thing on the water side. We're providing that first response. Of those 1,700 that we actually saw, so we excavated and either ran a current through it or seized it, uh, we had no issues with respect to damage on private. Our biggest issue, to be quite honest with you, was when we were installing the high line, the hose from house to house, we were damaging the hose bits more than anything else. Uh, but we never really came across the problem. If we did try to thaw a service where we could very clearly determine the problem was on private property, we would attempt to thaw, and if we could not thaw it, we'd turn the problem back over to the prop property owner and tell them we've done everything possible, but the problem is very clearly yours, you're going to have to and we left those people, the solution that in the most part was to leave them on uh, a high line with a temporary fee. But from your perspective, zero liability issues on uh, well, experience. Yeah, well, there is liability, but we didn't we didn't experience anything. You know, we we didn't we have no claims as of right now. We don't have any claims or anything. So, Paul, this is Dave from Thunder Bay. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, now, I, you're mentioning you borrowed hoses from your uh, a contractor. I'm assuming you were hooking people up house to house? Yes. Okay. Now, there we had considered that at one point in time. That's a practice we used to employ here as well. Um, now, it is above ground, so it's not the best issue, but, I mean, you, you can deal with it. Um, did you have any concerns? We stopped that practice for, for liability reasons, uh, being that, that we didn't have any control about what the homeowner uh, of the house you were drawing water from what they had done inside their own home. Uh, so we couldn't yeah. guarantee the quality of the water that was being provided to the next door neighbor. Right. Uh, did you guys have any issues with that? or? Uh, we didn't. The only thing that we did, and maybe very minor in the grand scheme of things, uh, we disinfected all of those hoses before we took them out. Right. So it, you know, they were slug disinfected before they were uh, before they were put into service. But yeah, it, you know, it is a concern, but the alternatives are no water for a prolonged period of time. So. Uh, I think we evaluated all of those risk factors and determined that, you know, risk is relatively low uh, and the upside to providing them water in the short term. And especially, you know, let's be honest, if you can avoid excavating, I mean, to have them on the high line and to back and, and to adjust their water bill is incredibly uh, less expensive than dropping a hole uh, to, to conduct a thaw. So uh, that was the thought process on our part. Yeah, definitely. I would agree. Um, now, one more question I have 
people know, you and also Carl from Kingston, I believe, uh, mentioned that you were excavating for every thaw. Um, now, did is this a common practice for everybody else? Or I know in Thunder Bay, what we do is uh, we use our valve keys uh, and go right on the service boxes and right on the main valves or whatever contact points we can get and use that for uh, a contact for a thawing. Uh, and uh, can everybody mute their line if they're just listening and not speaking? Thanks. Hi, Carl here. Hello? Hello? Hey, it's Carl. Yeah, we, we the reason why we went towards the excavation is because of the equipment that we have. We we didn't have the electric equipment, so we needed either access inside the home, um, and often there were maybe complications with getting that equipment out through the pipe, whether it had been had repairs on it um, or a kink in the line or something where we couldn't push the steaming equipment out. And that's when we moved towards the excavation to, to try to go from basically both directions. Right, so that was a last resort, yeah. When we yeah, did use no, our, uh, right. when we did use our hot water equipment, we did the same thing. We went from inside the house. Um, we did have to replace some stop and waste valves to a ball valve uh, to allow access, but uh, yeah, yeah, we did as well. Yeah. Um, I, I'm just curious with um, with Toronto. What, what, at what point, or maybe you did right off the bat, decide to go with with the high lines or the temporary water? Did you did you try to keep up for a while and then just and then made the decision or did you go down that road right off the bat? Well, we went down the road uh, right off the bat only because we had the experience last year. Um, right. So last year we we did what you suggested. We tried to keep up and then we just got so far behind that we had to provide the service. Yeah. Um, I mean, this year our I think our maximum wait time from uh, phone call to providing water now, not maybe not necessarily thaw, was up to about nine days. So there were some homes that were without water at all for you know a long period of time. So that's that's you know, that, that's the rationale for, for going. We we called it high lining. For yeah. Not sure if that's the industry standard or not. Yeah, well we we called it just a temporary water service, um, but same same thing. And I think if, if that's something that we would do sooner. So we, we tried to keep up and, you know, because we were getting a couple a day and then it went from like two a day to we had 40 in two days. So, so there's so challenges with that too. There's the advising, you have to tell them to keep the water running for that, otherwise the high line freeze. Yeah, absolutely. And you get into a whole other realm of customer service issues. Now now, now you're selling both the services and you're going out to deal with frozen high, high, high line. So there's some, uh, there's some inherent problems with that as well. And, uh, and, yeah, well, absolutely, and I and I feel very fortunate, as you guys probably do, to, to have a contractor to call on, and I believe it could have been the same contractor, but we also had a lot of support here in Kingston with temporary hoses that were here for a project for relining next year, and uh, they just happened to have a yard rented here and a heat can full of those hoses, so... I, I, I don't want to think what we could have done. Without, without that support, to me, that could be the single biggest issue we all could have had is yeah. getting a hold of some of those hoses if that uh, contractor wasn't there to help us. You know, and, and, and that's a strategy. You you put the high line on and you say, I'll see you in the spring. So, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. Can I ask about uh, prioritization? So uh, in situations where either you weren't using the high lines in Thunder Bay situation or you couldn't uh, because of proximity, uh, there wasn't a house that was close enough. Um, were you able to identify uh, vulnerable populations, let's say? Um, people who were a bit more isolated, didn't have water. Were you able to prioritize them? And if so, how did you identify them? So I'll pick up if, if Paul. Um, when we set up our SWAT team or our man team, uh, as part of our outreach, uh, we started asking people, were you elder, elderly? Did you have any medical conditions? Pregnant? Did you have any severe need for, wi uh, for water? Even did you have... Uh, uh, a water heating system within the home, and then we started to plug that into our responses, whether it was on the high line side or, or on the thawing side. Uh, but that didn't honestly kick in until probably day 10 of the event. Uh, but it's something that we would probably do if we do it all over again, we could build that in at, at the point. And, 
do you have the information to build it in, or, or is it just a question of the person who calls you ask the right questions from the get-go? Correct. We were, we were asking the caller to provide that information. Um, it's Gil again from Halton. We did have a number of interesting situations where we couldn't get a donor house, where the neighborhood relations were very good, and those we brought up to the top of the list. I guess they qualify for areas that you can't get a high line in, but um, typically we're able to manage on that basis. We were surprised to see so many of these crop up. Aren't you neighborly in Halton? What's going on there? Well, I am, but apparently there are some folks that aren't, I guess. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it does require a little bit of cooperation for sure. And um, I know you had gone to kind of the communications part and, and uh, what you were notifying. Um, and I don't know if there's anybody from Calgary on the line, uh, but um, I think one of the key points we were looking at is how do you predict if it's going to happen and when do you pull the trigger? And um, our construction crews were feeding back information like frost, frost depth. Uh, and one thing we found, number one, is it varies all over the place, depending upon where you are digging. Um, and the other issue was that um, uh, we were getting areas of frozen water services where the frost depth wasn't actually as deep as the service. So there's all kinds of different conditions. Now, I understand that Calgary had put in something like um, frost, frost depth measuring devices, like thermocouples give them a sense of how deep it's going. Because uh, that's one of the things that um, we did save ourselves because we had the frequent flyers, but we could have pulled the trigger a bit earlier had we known where the frost was going. I don't know if any municipalities have had a similar experience or they are some method to predict. I can speak on that a bit, Keo. This is Dave from Thunder Bay. Uh, in 2013-2014 winter, um, we were completely off guard. Uh, we ended up going back. We hadn't seen something like that, like Carrie said, in about 10 years. Um, now this past 2014-2015 uh, winter, uh, as soon as we started seeing houses pop up on that list, um, it was almost in the same order uh, as the previous winter where the shallower services were going to be coming in first. Uh, at that point, we decided to start calling people right away. Uh, and as well, we do have crews digging most of the time. Uh, so we were able to monitor the frost levels, and once they drop below about four to five feet, um, we just made the call and notified everybody from our list from the previous winter uh, to, to run their water. Okay. Well, I may, uh, we only have about uh, five or six minutes left. I may ask uh, anybody to answer this question, which is, uh, what did you learn in the last two years? Or what are you going to do differently if this happens next year? Which jobs, maybe? It's uh, Joel from Kingston, and I was curious about the Calgary comment on thermal couples measuring cross steps. Do we have many municipalities in Ontario that are doing that? We're going to be looking into it, Halton, but um, I didn't, in, in kind of talking to other municipalities, didn't hear of anyone doing this, so that was kind of where my question was coming from. Yeah, that was, uh, that's, nor do we, and that's a very, it's interesting, but it is just a tool to help us uh, as the uh, like conversation went, pull the trigger. We can, uh, we can do that for you. We can contact uh, folks in Calgary. They're not a member, obviously, but we can track somebody down there and find out a bit more for you and send out uh, some information for you. That would be great. Thank you. Um, there's one one thing um, I don't know if anyone spoke about sort of some of the conditions, not just the frost depth, I'm having trouble with frost, maybe because it's 30 degrees outside, but um, that many areas where there were storm sewers next to our water services were problematic, and I think uh, that's kind of um, across the board, but they were just a conduit for cold air. So I recently came across the municipalities that were putting. Um, kind of check valves on some of their storm sewers to not allow the air to come uh, free flow through. I don't know if that's the experience with others, but um, it may be difficult, like us, we're two tier. But that was one of the contributing factors to many services I understood. Anybody else have uh, concerns around the storm sewers and cold air breathing going through? Uh, this is Andrew from the city of Hamilton. We definitely experienced uh, those same problems. Uh, quickly jotted that note down because it's not something that we had come up with yet, but that's definitely a very viable option and something we'll definitely consider looking at for, uh, for next year. One of the things that uh, we had noticed was we have a spec that, that speaks to insulating a service, but really concentrates on insulating above it and doesn't always take into consideration the insulation on the side. Uh, so things like catch basins, manholes, uh, 
communicating walls where the graded drops and the exposed to that service are all issues that we brought up to our construction group. So maybe we want to go back and revisit just to make sure that that if in cases we're insulating the, the service, we're insulating it on all three sides, not just on the top. Um, one additional point about the construction side. Um, what we did see, and I don't know if this is contributory, but it's something to be aware of, is that when we do, uh, we are doing road reconstructions and grade alignments or realignments. In many cases, the grade does change, and we've been following, of course, the rule of thumb that as long as we have minimum depth, go ahead. But maybe this is a time to consider when you do re road reconstruction, you can't lower the road anymore because we need every inch of cover that we can take. And it may be something that is a bit of a preventative measure, but I know we encountered a few of those situations as well. Very good point. Anything else in terms of what you can tell households about how they can uh, prevent this? I guess uh, there's, there's no question they can't insulate their line to the house, but inside, is there anything they can do? or? Um, or how you communicate with uh, with folks to get the message out. One more time on, on the uh, communications front. Uh, we did see that many of our incidents, as, as many others, were private side issues due to the not heating their cold spaces and not taking, uh, everybody's trying to be energy conscious, so they're keeping their basements colder, they're unheating certain areas. And that could have probably saved a lot of calls if um, people uh, listen to that warning earlier, or at least that was a bit of a common understanding. Great. Great. Uh, Sandra again from the City of Hamilton. That's uh, something we're also looking at this year is to kind of exploring some different mediums to engage our residents so they can, you know, whether it's through a video, whether it's through pamphlets, showing them what they need to, uh, what they need to do to their basement for proper insulation, but also showing them, the, you know, the benefits of running your water. And also, should you have a contractor come out to inspect your plumbing, what are they looking for and what should you be expecting out of them? So we're kind of looking at different mediums to try and get that message across for next year. Uh, excellent. You know, uh, just with the last couple of minutes, maybe I could ask uh, each of you if you have certain communications materials, whether they be videos or just uh, website pages, if you could send links to the city's initiative. Um, then we can uh, just create a page on our website and just have that information available to you. You can just uh, scout around, see what others are, how they're communicating, and and uh, what materials they were using. Uh, I think video is probably very good. Uh, I just read that um, for uh, millennials, the their sole, their number one source of news information is no longer news or media websites, but it's Facebook. Which isn't too surprising, but uh, you know the use of social media is obviously important as well. Kind of sad. I'm sorry. It's kind of a sad statement, I think. Yeah. Um, just one other point. I, I don't know if it's the Great Lakes um, can do this, but um, when you look across Canada, some of the, our friends out to the west um, had probably even more significant and serious issues in the, for, in the last couple of years. And they've done a lot of work with respect to kind of adapting to these things and putting in systems. I know, I don't know, with Winnipeg, Edmonton, they have thousands of, of frozen services. So there may be some usefulness in reaching out to those organizations for information as well. Okay, and they may have uh, just council reports that we can that we sure. can as well. So I'll, I'll look into that as well. Thanks. Well, thank you very much for everybody who participated. Um, really good exchange. Uh, I think we could probably go on for another hour, but I think uh, hopefully you found this helpful. Uh, I want to thank Paul and Carrie in particular for uh, relating their own experiences. You've all been uh, uh, very calm about it. I remember uh, when it was all hitting and I was talking to some of you folks, you were just saying, I can't talk now. I just can't talk now. <laughs> there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't an extra moment to breathe. It, uh, you were all so busy uh, responding. So congratulations. Uh, for getting through two bad winters. Hopefully next winter will be better. But uh, we will write up some of the comments that we learned today and, uh, and ship that around uh, so we have a record of it. But we'll also find out if we can get a bit more information from some of those western cities and in particular Calgary. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for setting it up. Okay. Appreciate it.